for our third panel. And um, so this is how we're going to proceed. We will uh, uh, have François Eval uh, give uh, his talk. His paper, After Risk, is also on the website if you want to take a look at it. It's a rapid English translation. So, uh, and actually, neither of us have had the time to, 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 to read it in English. Um, so um, uh, there, but I'm, it's a great draft. And so uh, you can read it and we'll make any corrections necessary. Um, and then uh, we're going to have responses from Chris Burke and Julie Chu. So let me introduce everybody. And we'll go till approximately a little bit before five. And then afterwards, I'll invite uh, Pat O'Malley and Caitlin Zaloom back up to give some final brilliant insights uh, uh, before we all head over to the artist reception at 530 at the Logan Center. Um, so as you all know, uh, François Evald is the director of the École Nationale d'Assurance uh, in Paris and uh, really set the stage for many of our conversations with his uh, seminal book in, published in 1986 called L'État Providence, uh, the Provident State, the Welfare State, which was an exploration really of the way in which risk um, uh, became an important category through which uh, we could uh, spread uh, risk through society and create uh, different forms of, uh, of essentially solidarity um, through uh, techniques like uh, workmen's compensation and how this became a form of rationality that became dominant uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, uh, he is going to start with his talk on after risk. Um, then we'll have a short comment from Chris Burke, who is uh, a brilliant graduate student in political theory. And uh, Chris works in an area where I think uh, risk uh, is at play. Um, uh, he's investigating both the asylum and the prison uh, and parole. Uh, and um, as forms of, uh, as, as, as spaces where there is hidden self-governance uh, and maybe forms of those self-governance relate closely to issues of risk and thereafter. And then afterwards, we'll have a short comment by Julie Chu, uh, who is a professor of anthropology here at the University of Chicago. And um, uh, Julie is a sociocultural anthropologist uh, with an interest in mobility and migration, economy and value, ritual life, uh, material culture, media and technology, and state regulatory regimes. Uh, she's the author of a marvelous book uh, called Cosmologies of Credit, and I wish I had the book in my hand, but unfortunately all I have is the, is the, is the picture of the book in my hand. But uh, in our virtual world, that's, that's what we have. Uh, Cosmologies and Credit, Transnational Mobility and the Politics uh, of Destination in China, which was published by the Duke University Press in 2010. And her pr pr current project right now examines border technologies and the various infrastructures in place, uh, including legal rational, financial, cosmic, piratical, of managing the flows of people and things between southern China and the United States. So without any more introductions, let me ask Francois about it to present. So songs, Bernard. Songs for everything. My wife who is with me uh, in Chicago, but downtown said to me that Chicago downtown is quieter than New York. Mm. I can uh, certify that Chicago University is uh, characterized by, for me, especially by intensity. <laughs> so, um, after risk, for me, uh, that is not an affirmation, that is a question. You have to understand after risk with a question mark. But it seems to me 
that it is a question that is not possible not to ask in the present epistemological time, in the present epistemological context, this one of data, big data, super big data, which is now the context of knowledge. That is a question that is not possible not to ask if we work uh, in a Foucauldian perspective. Even if we are imposed to exceed the description of the modernity given by Foucault. That is a Foucauldian question, but which impose to go further than the description, the Foucault description of Michel Foucault, especially in discipline on punish. And that even if the question is a Foucauldian one, even if the best to deal with this question is to use the Foucauldian tool. At this stage of the research, it is certainly too early too premature to make a presentation, and particularly in a such famous place. That is my work at this time. But maybe uh, I am too small to face with a such uh, large question. But to, I am too old, I am old to and I think my task today is to open uh, to a uh, new research perspective, in particular in the, Fouc in the Foucauldian field. So please be indulgent uh, for, this, uh, for my talk. That is only indication for you. I am I, I am not sure to be capable to, to achieve this project, but maybe you, you can do that. After risk, uh, what that does mean for me? We can have two interpretations uh, to this uh, question, to the question we can we can uh, give uh, to the question two meanings. First interpretation, first meaning, after risk because we have to deal with events like disasters, events with low probability and high consequences, terrorism, And to manage this kind of uh, event, politician or uh, people, manager, decide to don't more use the term of risk. We speak again, for example, about danger, about threat, and what you want. We can observe since 20 years, we are confronted with, with search, we, we have difficulty to uh, confront 
this kind of event on the category of risk. One of the most famous discussion, uh, the, most, the most famous uh, expression of this difficulty, that is uh, the black swan by uh, Taleb. This, uh, mathematics, this trader mathematician uh, pupil from Mandelbrot. In this meaning, after risk means that the category of risk doesn't work to deal with this kind of reality. Risk appears to be a bad tool, a wrong tool, a dangerous tool, if we face with this kind of uh, events. And for this reason, we should abandon the use of the category to deal with this kind of situation. That is first meaning of the notion after it. I think, in a part, the talk of Pat this morning was in this direction. But there is another meaning another interpretation of the uh, notion of the question after risk. <clears throat> More complicated to explain in English. <laughs> we don't, in this meaning, we don't give up to use the notion of risk. So, we keep the notion. We keep the word but his epistemological condition will change. We speak still of risk, but that isn't the same risk than before. You know the word of risk is a very old one in French, especially in his verbal form. Risk exists long before the probabilist is probabilistic formula formalization, which is only one step in the story of risk. In this perspective, after risk means maybe we enter in a new moment in the formalization of the notion of risk. That is not exactly a moment where we use the notion of risk without the, pos the probabilistic means. No. That is a moment where we think risk in correlation, in relationship with data. After risk, with a question mark, that is The that uh, means the epistemological condition of risk in a digital age, in a digital context, in the context of digital knowledge. The research <coughs> has to develop in two directions. The first one is an epistemological one. We have to understand what the technology of data processing do change in the epistemological management of risk, that is, to deal with future events. The second one, the second direction of the research is the political one. You know that the use of probability 
to produce risk until now has given in the same move the possibility to set up certain political forms. Mutualization, for example. In the sphere of risk, epistemological design are at the same time political scheme. That is the reason for me why the question of data is in the same time an epistemological one and a political one. That is the reason because I sent to Bernard for this conference two texts. <laughs> one about prediction, and that is the epistemological aspect, and the second about the political dimension, that is omnes et singulatim, naturally, you uh, recognize uh, the text, the name, the, the title of a text, of a Foucault text. In my view, the question of data, the emergence of this new element, new element of knowledge, new condition of knowledge, impose us, force us, to understand, to undertake, excuse me, something like he did, like Foucault did, in Discipline and Punish, to undertake the analysis of the political anatomy in the area of data. <coughs> so, several words up first about uh, epistemological dimension. What I will only uh, explain what is my astonishing about this, my confrontation with data. That is a, a personal confrontation because uh, uh, or maybe I, 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 I give the story after the, I give the story with the question because when I, when, when I, when I worked with the insurance industry, I was confronted with this question about absolutely blind, about, with the question of genetic discrimination or this genetic discrimination, the question of this, of this, the question of genetic at this time, since the beginning of 90s, with uh, the decrypt, the decryptage, what is the, the term in English? Um, you know, DNA, um, DNA uh, description, decoding. De de decoding. decoding, was the hunter of biology in the world of data and uh, that is one reason for my interest i was blind i searched to be come on dit, voyant so in the first epistemological dimension i will only clarify one point where we can observes the difference in the uh, probabilistic treatment between risk and data and what happens today. That concerns the use of the statistical average. 
you know, in an epistemological point of view, in the, in the insurance technology, risk, that is another name for average. The classical rule was when we face a lot of data about certain kind of events, events in the nature, events in the society, when we face a lot of data, it is reasonable to deal with them such as we face only one event, the average. That is uh, the main rule uh, discussed by Kettler, for example. Naturally, make such assimilation is false. You identify things, event, different. But the rule say yes, we make certainly errors. And you know that the theory, the epistemolog epistemological, the classical epistemological theory of probability is a theory of errors. Error in the measure. Naturally, that is wrong. We make errors, but these errors said the statistical, said the mathematician, are theory theoretically and practically negligible. The consequence of the use of this category, average, is, as many, naturally, a lot of consequence, but directly a political one. The consequence of this category is assimilation. A use of comparison in the sense of assimilation. You are different, but in the perspective of the law of the nature, or of the law of the society, we can say you are the same. We are similar. We are comparable. But in the sense, we, we can say we are similar. You can be clever or idiot, you can be black or white, you can be man or woman, we are similar. We participate in the same human mankind. Even if we are in appearance different. Average for the people, for the people like Kettler. That is not, not only for this kind of people, that is uh, the tradition, the political tradition in the 19th century. Average, this practice of probability, give a foundation for the democracy. <coughs> My interrogation come from that. It seems to me, but maybe I am wrong because I am not uh, probably, I am not a mathematician, I am not computer engineer. It seems to me that in the age of data, we don't use the tool of average. 
computer data processing proceed not by assimilation, but by differentiation. That means that the knowledge is produced thanks to differentiation and not by assimilation. And differentiation without reference to something common. For example, in the decoding of the genome, we speak about we are decoding the human genome. In a data perspective, there is no human genome. There is only the genome of Bernard, the genome of Pat, the genome of Cathy, Absolute, but it is impossible to find the nature of the genome. And the study of the genome is the comparison between each genome. That is a work, a processing, a process of perpetual differentiation. A genome is always singular. My genome is not yours. And the biological knowledge at this time, in the time of data, is produced by what makes difference between each individual genome. Differentiation against assimilation the horizon of that, that is not similarity, but singularity. What consequences for the thought of risk? Naturally, the mathematician, the probabil probabilistician, continue to speak about risk. But this risk is after the precedent risk. That is the epistemological meaning of after risk. Risk still exists, but not like the chance to be in the same category, to share the same destinies and other. Risk is on the fact of my difference my singularity when there is no common. My uh, idea, maybe you know, if you are interested in the story of probabilistic, you know this book of Lawrence Kruger about the probabilistic revolution, where uh, that, that was a group of uh, researchers in in, in, in the end of the uh, 20th century, which was uh, uh, in, uh, which were in, uh, in Germany, and make the, the bilan, uh, balance sheet, the, the bilan of the probabilistic revolution in the sci social science, but also in the science of nature since the beginning of 19th century. And you can observe, this, this book is very interesting, you can observe that you know what is wonderful, that is, during this time, all the knowledge was framed by the probabilistic reasoning. And this reasoning produced new objects, produced new scientific reality, not only in social science, we are familiar with that, but also, for example, uh, uh, one or two examples, that is uh, the theory, the atomistic theory, the modern atomistic theory is completely linked to the probabilistic reasoning. Um, uh, the other uh, example that is very, very famous uh, that is Darwin. 
I think, I, I think we can suppose that what happened today with the data, uh, data processing, with the question of data, in the, where we, we can observe the same spreading through natural science and also social science, I think it will be interesting to observe how we can uh, live a, in the same revolution, like in 19th century with the, probab the classic probabilistic scheme. Um, something like climate change. You can think that is a produce of the era of data. Climate change has no, pos no epistemological possibility, no sense, in fact, without the treatment of an enormous amount of data about enormous uh, situation. Uh, now, in the physical science, there is no program in physical science where the <coughs> specialist of the discipline is not appareted with informatician. On, on, the, on the cost of the research in natural science, so what is the most expensive that is to pay the, the computer engineer, which produce data and transform the data to the scientific people. And naturally, the other example about what, how data create a new world, that is genetic, because genetic genetic in, in the sense, uh, in, in the sense of uh, modern sense, in the contemporary sense, that is uh, the transformation of uh, chemi, uh, molecular chemi in data, on the work, on the data. So, that is the first, uh, the first question. The second aspect, is uh, the political one. That is this aspect I try to uh, develop in my paper. Risk was or is a form of power knowledge relationship. In the same time, a form of knowledge, at the same time, a form of power through uh, insurance institutions and so on. I think data is also, we have to uh, deal with data also like power knowledge relationship, but of other kind, of other form. Uh, we can, uh, observe several aspects in this, uh, no. Many aspects should to be studied in this dimension. If we study the, rev the data revolution in the political field, we have, I think, we have to observe we have to make study in different fields. So the first one, very interesting, is the uh, economy, the so knowledge economics. The so transformation in the knowledge, in the economy of knowledge are very impressive because in the era of data, all knowledge is private. In fact, there are private companies that produce and they, uh, uh, they have the data. And that makes very hard constraint for the government 
for the university, for the institution, which product this move of open data. Open data, that is for state, a very uh, strong uh, uh, condition. This uh, question of privatization of science, privatization of knowledge, is in respect of power and knowledge relationship naturally very important. You have the question, that the most famous question are about the property of data. I decode your genome, who are the owner of the data? You, the company, Genetic, uh, Genetics, uh, answer. Or you have the problem of the free access to data. The free, question of free. That is, that are the question in the field of economics. Knowledge, um, I, 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 I hope that is good in English, knowledge economics. A second field, that is a, but, that is smaller, but uh, interesting too, that is, the future of insurance institution. That I'm, I think to the private insurance, but also uh, in the European country, the social insurance. My view is this one, that we are enter in a time where there is no homology between insurance proceeding of insurance institution on the proceeding of data of by the scientist. That is in the story of uh, insurance and risk conditions very new because what I try to explain in the Eta Providence, for example, that was the homogeneity between the scheme of insurance and the scheme of political theory of political governmentality. I think we are entered in a time where between the use of data by insurance and the use of data in general, there is no coincidence. Now, naturally, I think uh, the question that, that is the insurer doesn't know that at this time. But the conflict between the both, the, the both vision are already apparent in the law. That is about the question of discrimination the use of data on discrimination, for example, by insurance. On the response of the regulator, the response of the state, which is, we have to reduce the use of data, even if these data are pertinent to make the best, the good evaluation of the risk understand the shift until now the insurer believes that his proceeding of risk is an objective one. He discovered through the regulation that he can only work with a certain amount of data, not never a completely set of data. And now the regulators say, what is the good amount, the good set of data which are to be in the disposition of such kind of institution like in so For example, in Europe, we have two big uh, 
uh, institution to make regulation of insurance. The first one, naturally, that is the financial one, prudential uh, uh, discussion, prudential rule. But the second one, that is the regulation of data. On the, I think that, is, that exists already in, uh, in America, in certain states in America. For example, for the European insurer, that was is, uh, astonishing to discover that the regulator can decide the, the data about distinction male and female has to be prohibited from the field of insurance. Or you can observe that the life expectancy of a, wife, of a woman is not exactly the same that the life expectancy of a man. But in a social purpose, we can decide that certain kind of data has not to be uh, uh, in the play of the insurance industry. So what is, so, and that is, you, you, we have, we will, we will leave, we will like the, this, the conflict between the world of data and the world and the rule of such kind of institution. I think, now you know, that uh, uh, a main, a main field for the regulation in the in, in, in now is the regulation of data. The third aspect, the third field for me, is naturally uh, the field of power relationship. And there is discussion about in the in the world of data between is this world a big brother world where this one which uh, owns uh, the data has a super power on the individual? Certain person defend this uh, thesis. But other, uh, uh, other uh, uh, intellectual, other searcher plead exactly the inverse. In the age of the data, the, the world of data uh, marks the end of the center. That is a world of singularities without center. And I think, in your, uh, in your perspective, I think the discussion, what could be a counter power for this, uh, uh, for you uh, about liquidity on the, on the, in, the, in the future will be the, the obligation for this kind of people to s give her data on the discussion about this data by the people on the net. And I think that will be a form of regulation, a possible form of regulation. What are the main words in this uh, perspective, that is, the world is open. Open data, open government. With open, you have uh, uh, transparency. And with transparency, you have also accountability. And you know that People like uh, the President Obama, well, that was in his program in, in, uh, in, this, in this first mandate, was to use this, this data engineering like a new incentive for democracy, to give the possibility, to, to, to give the possibility for the citizen to uh, control the administration, how the money is used. So that means new form of power relationship. F 
first uh, field, what is, uh, is the field of subjectivation? You know the difference, uh, Bernard is a specialist, the difference between norm and profile. The word of data is no more a word of the norm, but profile. There is no norm, but a lot of profile. A, prof a profile that is what makes an individuum different of another. We uh, govern profile, no uh, uh, human means, like by Kettler. And what is very interesting, that is to observe that this, uh, uh, this, the relationship in the field of data are not passive by the citizen, not passive by the singularity. In contrast, that gives new possibility of activity. There is a specific subjective relationship from each singularity to the power through data, which is uh, under the sign of activity, not passivity. That is very interesting. I think that is a, a last, for me, a last field we have to, uh, to study. That is, what kind of subjectivity is linked to this, uh, uh, to this uh, set of uh, knowledge set of uh, relationship, of power relationship. Naturally, you know the notion of social uh, uh, networks. So that is my, uh, that is my, uh, that is what I mean by after risk. That is, Actually, you understand that that is a program for a university like Chicago where you can find, uh, actually that, that could be only an interdisciplinary program with a computer, mathematician, uh, geneticist, specialist of political science. But I think today, if we are, if we are interested, if, if we are a little Foucauldian, it is absolutely impossible, in fact, it is a fault Maybe I am wrong, maybe my interpretations are wrong, but not to, not, to, not to put this question at the core of the work is a fault. Is it too much? Give me more. <laughs> <laughs> So, for the first comment, we'll turn to Chris Burke. Chris? All right. Well, I first want to thank Professor Awop for uh, his work, past and present. It's definitely been something that's helped clarify and challenge my own thinking on risk and related issues. Um, uh, the paper, After Risk, was a particular pleasure to read, and I look forward to its eventual publication. Um, one caveat, just to throw at the beginning, is that I'm definitely not an expert in technology. I'm somebody that's concerned mainly with the politics and philosophy of punishment. In the brief time I have, I want to focus on two claims Professor um, Awald makes in the paper. I'm um, specifically related to uh, some of his more epistemological claims. And then I want to conclude with a thought about how this type of analysis can be useful for the criminal justice system. So first, I want to think about the object of the paper, this idea of big data. The first claim I want to push against is the idea that the novelty of big data inheres in the quality or quantity of available data itself. A quick glance at the historical records suggests other eras, other contexts, characterized by the proliferation of statistical information at various levels of granularity. For example, one need only quickly glance at the archives of US prisons and asylums at the turn of the 20th century to see the psychiatric profession's obsession with documenting the various and sundry features of patients and prisoners in, for the time, nearly exhaustive detail. This is all to say that the proliferation of data might be a necessary but not sufficient condition to Ewald's characterization of big data as a new model of governance. 
In our era, against the psychiatric reformers of the asylum and prison at the turn of the 19th century, we have a previously unfathomable ability to store, model, and compute vast data sets. The level or grain of data is undeniably finer. Consider, for example, the ability, as was pointed out, to map one's entire genome for only a few thousand dollars now, or at least soon. Uh, however, more than that, what I'd argue is that for the last 30 years, it's not been about a proliferation of data, but actually it's about computational power that's increased. Big data, I'd argue, is essentially a problem for computation. What's unique in our era is our ability to model complex systems. For example, consider the extension of operations research into education and healthcare, or the creation of com complex predictive algorithms from open data sets like the Netflix prize for a million dollars if anyone can um, predict the best predictions for a customer's uh, movie preferences, or the ability to quantify ties within gang networks to predict future likelihoods of violence. If we were to search for a new governmentality related to big data, it would need to involve, as I see it, computation and a discussion of the various models of complex systems in which we've come to understand that data. And what I don't see necessarily in the story that's provided in this paper is that discussion precisely about understanding data mining and how to analyze complex systems and the importance of something like computational power, which is unique to our era to be able to sort through that much information. The second claim that I'd like to push against is the idea that the, what he calls the device of big data represents an epistemological tension or transformation in, the kind from, in kind from the more familiar world of risk. Epistemologically, Ewald suggests the unique FART features are, in essence, one, scale, and second, what he calls a one-to-one -one relationship, and I'll address each in turn. The fir first, scale. Scale, of course, invites questions about thresholds. Our desire to know, as my earlier comment suggested, is not something that is unique to our era. We have a fascination with data collection that is, uh, seems to transcend the, the last couple of centuries. At what point does large-scale data collection become data to quote en masse? The second feature is this emphasis on treating individuals one-to-one -one and not assuming them under general categories is an intriguing thought. But what I wonder is about the accuracy of this characterization. For one, I'd argue that categories are not absent or removed. Rather, what happens is that in these sort of complex systems and where you have the proliferation of data, they're arrived at inductively rather than deductively. The point of something like data mining, at least my understanding as a non-expert, is to find patterns to extract knowledge from an existing data set with an eye to transform it into an understandable structure for future use, i.e. into a generalized predictive model. The model might be built differently than maybe in the past, but it still strikes me as being a kind of generalized model that is not necessarily tailored to an individual. My last comment is definitely connected to my area of interest, which uh, Professor Harcourt uh, mentioned earlier, having to do with the philosophy and politics of punishment. And it has to do with this concept of profile, which made me immediately think of uh, criminal profiles. And one of the implications, I think, of Ewald's argument for the politics of punishment is that we might, in fact, be moving away from Ernest Burgess and trying to predict the various risk factors for one to recidivate when coming out of prison, or the various other uses of risk in the criminal justice system. As an open question, I wonder how might big data transform the governance of crime and punishment. Uh, revolutionaries in, in this idea, like Gary Becker and his work on crime, sort of had the erasure of biological theories of crime. Now I wonder if we're at the era in which we have the erasure of the rational decision-making frame. If we start thinking of systems and processes, perhaps we're in a new era in which we discuss not criminals, but we suggest criminal patterns, criminal systems, that we mine data from layers of social relationships to respond and to adapt our policing tactics. We look at the characteristics of neighborhoods or of personal networks of police, but no longer of subjects. So I think one of the interesting challenges that provided this paper that's a open uh, question to folks that are interested in criminal justice is that what does it mean to move beyond a world of Ernest Burgess and simple prediction to one of big data and what will be made of these new systems? And I realized I went through that very fast, but once again I just wanted to say that thank you, it was a pleasure to read, and I uh, look forward to the discussion, and I think it's a, a wonderful wonderful topic. I think the, the notion of data in the proceeding of data mining are not the same as the data in the 17th century. 
Natalie, what I say is uh, that is only, uh, I express only my difficulties, not my certainty. But in the, st in the story, I think in the story of knowledge, you know, the first stage of knowledge is sensation. Uh, I, what is a sensation? Sensation. sensation? Perception. That is data. But this, the question for the classical theory of uh, knowledge, the data of perception are a problem. There are two, uh, two, uh, two big, uh, with that give illusion on the work is to find what is a good category to deal not with the data, but to can, to can be free in, in a certain sense with the data. And I think my, my perception is with the use when our brain is coupled with uh, computer, uh, the computer of today, it is not necessary to make uh, the detour by the category to uh, deal with the data. And I think in the theory, in the knowledge theory, that is something, there is something different. Alors, naturally, we, if, if we, s a question, you, and you are right to ask the question, that is, which relationship between a category in the philosophical sense and a model, and a graph, because the data are expressed in the computer by graph. What is the relationship? You are, maybe that is the same thing. But in fact, we can, we can work on each data without lost any data with this, uh, the data mining processing. And uh, we use other tool to uh, summarize, the, maybe other tools that category, but that, that model or uh, graph uh, and so on. No, that is a question. Uh, in the sense, naturally, so naturally, the question of data is absolutely not new. The question of abundance of data is not new. But before, that was a problem. And that was the reason because statisticians gave techniques to deal with these Profusion with this, with with a number, with a large number of data, but I think that with the computer, with the di digitalization, with the as numerization, give new possibility. Uh, on, 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 I think uh, that is a heuristic uh, uh, thesis that it, we have we have to observe. Uh, uh, we have to observe if that is the same uh, uh, knowledge theory at work or another. We have, we have, that is a question. I have not uh, the response. Actually, in, in the financial sector, a lot of products, a lot of reality are produced by the data on, on your trader. He knows only, he, he doesn't know the reality, he knows only the data on his, his game, that is a game on data. And because this, uh, the computer, the computer produces uh, permanently a lot, a lot, a lot of data. Uh, and you have, uh, th there was, there is in, in this field a, a very interesting book, the book of, uh, Economist uh, of uh, Yale, uh, 
with we wrote recently with Akalov a book about animal spirit. Please. No. Uh, no. Um, he, he, he wrote in, in the 2002, he, he wrote a book about the new financial order. And he said, what kind of insurance product we can uh, imagine, we can, what kind of financial product we can imagine in an age where we have data? And he that is, he this book is, a, is a, that is a, like a, a utopia, a financial, the new financial insurance scheme, where he said the reality was it, uh, something different. Where he said through the data we can see a fin financial solidarity between each uh, country in the world. So it was uh, so. So paradise, the paradise. Oh, that's his name, I don't remember. Yes, Schiller. Robert Schiller, yes. So, uh, so, so we have, alors, the question of criminal, the question of profile of, of criminality, that is interesting uh, because I think that was the work of, of Bernard, uh, on, but we can observe uh, the same is, is, is thing very analog in the French, uh, uh, in the story of medicine. Uh, a <clears throat> professor of medicine in France wrote a book about the, the, the modernization of, uh, of medicine, and he explained how in the, uh, 18, in, in the 19th century, the, the epidemiology on the evidence-based medicine was a product of insurance. Because in fact, that was the insurer, they uh, make, uh, they, they have this, this vision for the classification to know if this applicant is set in the good category. And for that, he search, he, he make epidemiology, and that is, the foundation of the evidence-based medicine. That means that in the field of insurance, you have search for individualization. So, but my question, no, the question of profiling of individualization doesn't come from the data. But my question is, what does become the question, the, the treatment of individualization in the age of data. And in, it seems to me, for, for your question about uh, criminal, uh, about the uh, recidive, uh, recidivism, uh, recidivism uh, we have now the, the question of individualization, on that, the, the question for Burgess to understand how it is possible to deal with a, a population not, uh, not in the world, because one of the consequences, if there is recidive, we have uh, the, the conduct, uh, the precautionary conduct will be to, uh, for, to forbid any form of uh, con liberation conditionnel. Mm -hmm. And the search is, oh, if we can, if we can find uh, good instrument to make differentiation between in the population, we can. Mm -hmm. oh, the, that was uh, the, the, the reason. And, so that is not, the question is not new, but my question is what this whole question becomes in, with this new instrument? You, you, you understand? Mm -hmm. Good. Julie? Okay. Thanks everyone for sticking around. I know I'm the last one to give her two cents. And I, I first want to just thank um, the organizers, Bernard and Anwen, for inviting me um, to give some comments about Professor Evald's paper, which um, for me has already been really stimulating in terms of thinking through my own work. And um, with my time here, I, I want to try to work through two themes. Um, one is just thinking across this, the three papers. Um, that we've discussed today, I was really struck by 
um, the, the kind of relationality to risk that the papers frame, which is a relationship of from, to, and after. And um, what I want to, to, to push us to consider um, working through is um, thinking about uh, actually what is thinkable and operable alongside, around, and entangled uh, with risks, which is how I approach thinking about um, risks laterally in my work, which I'll discuss a little, a little bit. Um, and then secondly, um, I want to just offer a response to one of uh, Professor Evald's consideration, um, which he elaborates much more in his uh, larger paper, which is about the political promise of data in remaking uh, the world of risk and insurance. Um, but I want to do this not by talking in terms of um, these features of the digital world that um, we often think of in terms of enabling freedoms, uh, which often has to do with digital interface, you know, thinking about the digital world in terms of interface, and that's in terms of decentralized connections and flows in the service of knowledge and power. Um, but what I want to do is consider something like di the digital world as infrastructure in which we might think about fruitful bottlenecks, disconnections, and noise in the proliferation of what um, I think might be better be, be described as the relationship of non-knowledge to power um, in the world of digital devices. Um, so in my own work on the regulation of listed and illicit flows between southern China and the US, um, as I've mentioned, I've been grappling not so much with the from and to and after of risk, but what perdures and proliferates alongside risk. Um, for instance, in the way that worlds of chance and luck are enhanced and entangled with um, risk management. And so um, my most recent work, I've been looking at how the installment of risk management systems um, in customs inspection as part of the reform and modernization of customs in China has been accompanied by um, a very strange and interesting proliferation of interest among customs staff in fortune telling, praying at temples, and making massive donations. Um, and this comes up um, in discussions about risk, um, in which here you have newly reformed managers of risk who found themselves also being at risk, uh, just going back to Christian's comments, as risk factors themselves are both managers and also incorporated into the programs that are monitoring their modern way of governing um, customs. Um, and when, when you bring up the, the question of risk, um, it's, uh, the response is often a little bit more than a shrug. And I'm really interested in the shrug as a kind of stance towards this figure of risk, which is often is actually shared um, with uh, the prior people I've looked at, uh, the subjects of human smuggling between southern China and the US. Um, but uh, what's interesting is when um, this set of interlocutors find out that me and my colleagues who are talking with them have private, previously worked in popular religion, um, they can't stop asking us about where to find the best fortune tellers, telling us about, um, you know, trying to get advice from us about how to detect the difference between credible uh, uh, prognosticators of the, of the future, you know, these fortune tellers, and uh, non-credible ones. And hosting, uh, I, I, I sense that this is larger than a phenomenon in the local area I work. Um, because uh, one of them was interested, mentioned that he was hosting some big wig official from the center of China from Beijing in which that person also had an interest to, to be exposed to the, the fruitful, rich world of uh, divin divination in, in southern China. Um, and uh, what's interesting is uh, just, just to further complicate and cross the wires or worlds of risk and chance, I want to note that um, where I work in southern China, there are now diviners who make a living um, by reading fortune through uh, computer processing programs in which they input data that you give, um, very much like demographic, personal, bureaucratic data into software and print out a chart and will tell you your cosmological uh, 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 trajectory into the next year. Um, and I think what the computerized fortune telling program tells us here is less about the historical break between worlds of chance, sovereignty, risk, or data per se than, uh, than about something like the social fact of remediation in which old instruments of knowledge power do not disappear to enable more direct and transparent uh, or you know, distinctly different modes of communication uh, and engagement. Uh, but rather, these traces are carried forward and become the very embedded content 
of new media technology. And, and here, this is an old insight that I draw from people like uh, Marjo McLuhan and, and into uh, Friedrich Hitler, who per Professor Evald mentioned. Um, so in many cases, you know, the astrological chart of the sages are turned into program code and then reformatted as computer printout for reading the future. Um, it's hard to see here um, uh, that the calculator logics uh, in, in this particular scenario in terms of any kind of singular shift from X to Y, from risk to something else, um, uh, or as a marking of a before, a clean break before and after. Um, and rather what the fortune telling software demands here is attention to lateral relations and resonances of the alongside and the mesh works. Uh, and, and I use this sort of drawing from Tim Ingle's work rather than networks with sort of linearity of lines and nodes of the entangled and embedded worlds of calculation lingering and proliferating in tandem with institutions and practices organized around risk. Um, so that's uh, you know, the first point I wanted to make. And um, now on to thinking about the political promise of data um, in remaking the world of risk and insurance. Um, and I know P Professor Eval has already framed it this way, but you know, I also, reading his paper, took after risk as an argument not about the disappearance of risk, but about its reformatting in terms of data in the digital world. Um, but what of data, and you know, I, this is a question um, and co that already came out in Chris's comments. Um, what exactly is data in this world of digital knowledge power? Uh, the world of risk, after all, had its own claim on data. And this is something that's already come up in discussion. A world of data collection and data sets, where data could be said to play a supporting role as a feature of risk management. And whereas I think what Professor Yuval is trying to suggest is data in the digital world might be thought of more like a general operating principle for knowledge power. And among the many important shifts in uh, this ontology of data in the digital world in uh, which he tracks, including um, you know, thinking about uh, norm to differentiate a profile, um, what I'm most interested in is discussing something that I, don't, I think is more in the paper than came out in the talk, um, which are the features of data's new abundance and accessibility. Um, which uh, in his work, he gestures in the paper, gestures to the promise of political freedom. And here I quote from the paper, quote, the digi digital power gives citizens the means to a kind of reversal of power in which the supervisor eventually becomes the one being monitored. So one might think that the more digital power develops, the more it will empower citizens. And here uh, he's inciting um, a recent phenomenon like uh, the use of social networking uh, in, as a catalyst for the Arab Spring uh, situation. Or I, I think of something like microblogging in, in China. Um, um, but yet what's important here is uh, Professor Yuval also cautions that there's nothing inevitable about empowerment through digital flows of data. And I think this is something that actually we could all uh, push a little bit more and be skeptical about uh, these attachments of you know, freedom to uh, the free flow of information. Um, and what's interesting uh, to me is that uh, it's telling that I think we no longer talk of data simply as something collected and set, that is as data collection, which leads to data sets managed and processed uh, through discrete analog machines. You know, in that sort of uh, turn of the 19th to 20th century, you know, Kitlerian world of uh, uh, discrete electronic uh, uh, instruments. Um, to, and with digital devices, um, what, what has become common parlance for us, which I think Chris already gestured to, are do we talk in terms of things like data mining and data streams. Uh, data as something mined highlights the digital world and its parts as a variegated landscape of interface and infrastructure. Whereas data as stream, I think, points to a world in which it is, um, as uh, media theorist Paul Virilio once suggested, perhaps chronopolitics rather than geopolitics that is now shaping um, how we might think about the relation of knowledge and power. And I think these issues of speed or slowness uh, also comes up in thinking about something like liquidity as uh, ethic. Um, now, to think of data as something mine also suggests that we should attend more carefully to the distinctions of parts in the digital world. Again, a social landscape which most users encounter as interface, uh, but which through a, no, a, a notion like data mining reminds us that we also have to think of infrastructure 
and infrastructure and like interface, I think does not lend itself so well to the decentralizing promise of free flows of information. You know, if not centralization, it points to the limitations rather than abundance of connectivity and speed in which firewalls and bottlenecks in places like China can make all the difference. And I, I would say a really illuminating article is actually uh, the, the science fiction writer uh, Neil Stevenson who wrote a piece on Wired about a decade ago called Mother Earth Motherboard in which he actually tracks the laying down of a, a fiber optic cable under sea. And he points out to the asymmetries of connectivity when you look infrastructurally in which a place like the US has you know, 20 fiber optic cables connecting it to the World Wide Web and in China you have four. Uh, so the notion of flow uh, and, and stoppage and the slowing down plays out very differently in these two kinds of uh, scenarios. Um, there's perhaps uh, no better counterpoint to utopic visions of the free flow of digital data than the very commodified digital uh, form in the uh, 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 world of internet, which is this computer program called Freedom. I don't know if anyone knows this program, which is a software you can download for 10 bucks, which promises to enhance productivity by locking out the computer user from accessing the internet. And so here, freedom is framed as respite from the onslaught of data and instant online connections, where one can easily become distracted and paralyzed by too much access to too much data. Now, one thing freedom, the software, highlights is how political promise of data may be less about connecting to open and abundant flows of information, so much as finding productive disconnections and pockets of insulation from the governing logics of big data and their digital devices. As flows of bytes move across electric sensors to underwater cables to pixels on the screen, data cannot necessarily, I want to argue, be conflated with information, let alone knowledge in the digital world. Mine and streamed in abundance, data can also flow less as a signal of knowledge than as an onslaught of noise, a burden and intrusion, junk mail, not email, too fast and too much be to become legible as useful information. And I think it's really clear when you look at the post 9-11 sort of self-flagellations in congressional hearings, uh, the uh, Osama bin Laden memo is a really good example of data, in fact, not rising to, this, to the legibility of information. Here are the many bits of pieces that went through the hands uh, of these very uh, decision makers in uh, the US, US government. Um, and you can also see this in something like the promise yet complete debacle and failure of the project of TIA, Total Information Awareness, which was posited as a security solution. Um, after 9-11. Um, now, writing of, and I'll just end with this, because I, I couldn't help uh, think, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about zombies and uh, a zombie apocalypse and a particular piece that the journalist uh, Chuck Klosterman had wrote a couple years ago. Um, now, writing of the new fascination with zombie ap apocalypse in American popular culture today, and he was thinking about things like The Walking Dead on, I don't know if anyone's seen this, which is a huge hit. Um, the journalist Chuck Klosterman suggested that in the unending inundation of the senseless dead, in which the only response is to eliminate, to delete, uh, here you have a parable of the anxieties of the data overflow, in which abundance and access do not lead to freedom, but devour the person, breaking the human subject down into mincemeat for zombies, the divisuated fragments and bits of uh, the kind of data mining profile that I think uh, uh, Professor Eval is gesturing to. And uh, this is a piece in many ways about the immensity, you know, uh, sort of invites us, his class, classroom's piece invites us to think about the immensity of the apocalyptic bite. And by that, I not only mean a uh, zombie bite, but thinking about the, much the muchness of data of a megabyte, gigabyte, and now we're up to terabyte, which reformats the human into the traces of data stream, bits of the profile. Um, as insensible flow of you know, inundation of data. And here we can think about, again, data can be noise, uh, not information, not rising to something like knowledge. Um, and so uh, Klosterman writes, quote, zombie killing is philosophically similar to reading and deleting 400 word emails on Monday morning, or filling out paperwork that only generates more paperwork, or following Twitter gossip out of obligation, or performing tedious tasks in which the only true risk is being consumed by the avalanche. The principal downside to any zombie attack is that the zombies will never stop coming. The principal downside to life is that you will never be able to finish 
with whatever it is you do. Now, ultimately, I want to suggest that the political promise here might be in thinking not so much through the digital devices of information processing and transmission, as much as through the enabling gaps, disconnections, and even errors in the production of a data-centric world. And I, I'm seeing this on the, the ground in the ethnography, and people say, yeah, we have all the computers, we have all the fancy technologies. But when it comes down to it, it's still, uh, people say, so it's a world of uh, human feeling, human intuition. Humans have to connect these together. So in the interval between connection, in fact, all kinds of interesting things flourish. Um, and, and so in this case, we may also want to rethink the salient links between the whole and its parts in the digital world. And uh, this is a theme that uh, Professor Evald draws out of his paper, that we should be thinking about how to link up wholes and parts with reformatting of risks in the world of the digital. Um, but I want to suggest that this is a relation, again, ne not necessarily of knowledge power, but rather of non-knowledge and power. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Non-knowledge and power. Yes, Judy. <laughs> Song Judy. I will... Uh, uh, I would like to take you in my team. <laughs> <laughs> Zombie fighting team? <laughs> Two remarks. For me, data is not a solution, but a problem. But I think Our problem, we have to think, we have to observe, we have to study how our problem are asked now in the, in the, with this kind of tool of digital world and so on. So, not a solution, but a problem. But I think our problem, our classical problem, our Foucauldian problem, we have, in the field of data, we, we have a, we, 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 we are confronted with a lot of Foucauldian questions about what is knowledge, not knowledge, what is true, what is uh, relationship between individual, relationship with power, and so on. But I think we have, an, we have to understand, because we don't decide from, from that, uh, what uh, happens uh, in, the, in the era of data. That is a, that is my that is my first uh, my first observation. My second is what is this one? And naturally, you can say uh, that is not information but noise. That is your dream. That's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that in the area of, in fact, there is no noise. But what is noise for you is not necessarily noise for a company. On what we what we can observe, on what we what what will be the, the future, that is a lot of. Uh, I think the relation, you know, but that is the notion of service of services. We we will uh, see an industry uh, develop to transform the noise into services for personal, for individual. Uh, what is noise at a time is not necessarily noise in another time. And I think we will, uh, the moment is not exactly, the, the, we are exactly at the moment where we will see that a lot of companies, well, since that is already the, the case of Google, for example, with geolocalization and, and so on, will transform, will share to transform the, the amount of data, what I can do with this kind of data to uh, sell a service to each one. Uh, that is the reason because I, I, I I speak from one to one. That is, uh, or omnes, or the whole for each one, 
that is the, the, the role uh, of this uh, industry will be to, to, give the, to give access for each one uh, at the all at the, uh, at the data of the of the, of the all. You, you understand? Well, I, I the told you that is not clear. My English is so bad. But so and that is you are not the, the the relationship is not individual to omnes, but what is the whole data produced by each one, that is the whole, is transformed and dedicated to each singularity. And in, in, the, in the meaning that we have, I have to adapt these, the, the amount of information, the amount of noise for you, into a specific service adapted for each singularity. Um, so I, I want to build on some of the, the things that, that Julie said by, uh, by making uh, three points. Uh, one of them is that I think that here the materiality of data does, does matter and, and what, is, what actually constitutes data. And, and I can speak to biology, which is, which is what I know, which is that within genome science, data means many different things depending on who the genomicist is that you're talking to. So for population genetics, um, data is still the Harvey Weinberg equilibrium, which was established in the 1950s as a fundamental equation by which data is expressed. For a genome annotator, data is a blast algorithm which tells you how to annotate a particular genome sequence. Um, for people who are involved in modeling complex relationships within systems, systems biology acquires new materialities of data. For functional genomics, data has comparative dimensions across organisms and systems and so on and so forth. So I guess the first point I want to suggest is that there's an epistemic non-singularity of data that is particularly evident in post-genomic biology and that biologists are wrestling with all the time. The second point is that when, when biologists are talking about building or, or dealing with the problem of data, they're often not talking about a problem of knowledge, but about infrastructure. And this is something that, and, and, and this is a point you made that you to, this is something that Sabina Lionelli is, 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 is seeing in her work on genomics, but that also Sharon Traubig is seeing in her work on physics. And so it could quite be possible that the problem of data is such that data emerges not as knowledge, but as an object. And the very material nature of, of data might not have anything to do with knowledge in the way that we might, we might think. And the third point is that perhaps data is not about fact in the same way as information in an earlier era was about fact, but rather that it's about mobilities of various sorts and movements across domains and the construction of domains. And in that context, I wonder about the knowledge of, of knowledge power, because when Foucault talks about knowledge in relation to power, he really is concerned with the question of truth. And this is why epistemology really matters. But what if we're dealing with knowledge domains where what is at stake is not truth, but translation, and the various movements across domains? So Mary Morgan, for instance, has edited a volume that is about how facts travel. And in that volume, the question of objectivity or facticity or the truth value of facts doesn't matter so much as the question of the portability of something that can be called a fact and be made to move as a, as a result of that. So I guess in addition to this question of uh, non-knowledge and constituting knowledge regimes, I would ask the question of the object of knowledge, the question of a knowledge that has to do with translation rather than with truth, but also the question of the relationship between knowledge and value, and not just knowledge and power. Um, just, just on this point of translation, um, I would also note that uh, translation itself is a question. Um, so objects can travel as, as in terms of transmission rather than any kind of trans relatability at all. And I, I was thinking, um, I mean, in terms of relating this to politics, I was thinking about Vicente Raphael's work about testing, texting in the social movement in which 
um, the point was connectivity. It was about the forward becomes the message of the political, uh, that's, that's the political act. It's, it's at, at all not about any kind of translatable information or thing. It's just about connecting. Um, and think about how often we get these petitions, uh, you know, digitally in which, you know, again, the thinking through interface, uh, you know, the, 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 the political agency becomes just, the, it's just signaling transmission, in fact, is not at all has anything to do with, it is about the object traveling, but that in and of itself is uh, the act. Um, and so translate, translation in that sense is even a question. Uh, I was going to ask a question about the, the captability um, model you were, you were raising um, in connection to what Professor True was talking about um, in terms of the noisiness of data and, in, 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 and the amount and co 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 complexity of big data there is, right? Because it seems to me that talk, we're talking about it in terms of transparency and accountability um, instead of other modes of political action you could think about maybe is part of the um, is part of the problem in the sense that it reinforces the very division of labor in politics um, that that is uh, the very division of labor that um, that is uh, from 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 which the problem comes is in it's because they uh, the reason we have a uh, reason we have some people in positions of authority or the governmentality or others in our democracies is because of how complex the data is, or that is the argument in advance, right? That because there is such complex data, so much data to go through to know how to manage the economy, it cannot be what every citizen does. It can only be um, what some people do because they have the time to, the knowledge to. So given that the division of labor in our democracies it seems like talk, uh, to talking about it in terms of transparency, accountability, with some some people who govern and other people who, who just surveillance them, might instead of other modes of empowerment, um, which don't, which 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 don't which try and blur that, that distinction. I think it is interesting to observe what happened in the field of uh, scientific expertise. And um, where you can observe that uh, we, now the idea is we have to take in consideration if, uh, every kind of data, not only the data produced by scientific uh, uh, methodolo methodology, but we have to take data, we have to take in consideration data uh, they are produced by people, they are produced by, uh, by the tradition, they are produced by, you know, by uh, uh, ecology, by ecologists, by, uh, and so on. And that means that uh, I think this, uh, this question is very interesting. Uh, the, Possibly this uh, era of, of data give, uh, uh, give new possibility for this kind of uh, producing uh, knowledge about certain certain question. So uh, I am. Naturally, uh, we don't, we, we have to be very cautious. That means that when we observe something in a certain field, it is, it is not a reason to, to say that is everywhere the same. But we can observe certain kind of practice, or certain kind of practice in certain field, we can observe other kind of practice in other field. Uh, so that, that is clear. And I think data that is another, another, uh, another framework for uh, power relationship. And what is, but that is another play, that is another, another game to play this, uh, this power relationship. So let me do this. Um, let me just make one short intervention, as short as possible, but. Um, 
I, 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 I wanted to say something in relationship to data. And then uh, we're kind of already somewhat over time, but, um, and then what I thought was we could then get one final brilliant insight from uh, Caitlin and then one final brilliant insight from Pat, um, and then we'll call it a day. Um, and so if, if, if I had more time, what I would want to do in some sense is explore how this, how this paradigm of, uh, of big data or as is true of the other paradigms, perhaps resilience and also liquidity, how they work with, um, how they are, can be integrated into, and how, how they require modifications of other forms of rationality. Um, and so one can think of kind of different ways in which uh, theoretically we think about uh, social spaces, et cetera, and how something like big data might change that. Three quick examples. Rational choice theory, right, for instance. Um, there's a sense in which uh, the advent of big data doesn't necessarily require a modification of the fundamental structures of rational choice theory, that somehow, actually, that, 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 um, that the knowing subject is supposed to be actually, is imputed as engaging in form of computational big data analysis all the time. Um, so uh, in, a, in, a, in a model of taste for discrimination, for instance, it's assuming that whoever it is that is experiencing these forms of utility, these tastes, et cetera, is making massive, massive uh, computational big data uh, absorptions at all times, right? The, the models of, actually the models of racial profiling that economists come up with assume that police officers can be doing the work of a computer at all times to maximize uh, efficiency, um, et cetera. So it, it might or it might not. Um, pre other predictive approaches that are going to change. And what's fascinating, for instance, in the context of the tools that were developed starting in the early 20th, early, early 20th century with Burgess, et cetera, on parole prediction, et cetera, is that they actually depended on low computation. Um, they, computational skill, increases in computational skills diminish the predictive capabilities uh, on, on future samples. In other words, because the minute you can do the work on, on big data that is extraordinarily refined with a computational multi-variable uh, regression analysis. It does an extraordinary job on that particular sample, but it is far less predictive on the next sample of 3,000 people, right? Um, and so you actually need to change the way in which you think about prediction um, as a result of these different paradigms. And then a third would be structuralist approaches, right? Structural approaches. Structural approaches which tend to generally rely on uh, binary distinctions. Um, uh, you know, you could think of the work of Bourdieu and the Khalil House or something like that, but the way in which it's possible that um, big data and computation would fundamentally unsettle that form of rationality. So, so some seem to be impervious, some require transformation, some are unsettled by um, these different ways in which we think about um, risk and evolving paradigms of risk. Um, so that would be for a longer, a longer analysis. But since we're running out of time, um, I thought what we could try and do is get final, final insights on the future of risk. Caitlin? <laughs> you want to you want a mic or something? Yeah, or, uh, you know? sure, just, uh, Here, take my seat. So this is this is quite a, a task that Bernard has uh, has set for for me. But um, I think that the the place that I, I find myself um, at the end of this day and after considering these papers is actually considering perhaps less the concept of risk than the possibility of apprehending the future in a slightly different 
way. And what I, um, what I mean by this is that we might think, uh, we might think of how the future has come to seem um, under the conditions of big data and contemporary warfare and contemporary markets. And, and that, I, I, I think that there is a commonality there, which is, uh, which is the experience of volatility. And by volatility, I don't, I don't mean that kind of volatility that, that uh, Bernard uh, and I were, were going back and forth about before, but I mean the, um, the, the apprehension of constant change and the, and the demand to adjust to that constant, constant change. So the kind of resilient subject that Pat described um, this morning is one that can, in the present moment, adapt to whatever is coming at it. And big data is actually characterized by a similar kind of temporality. Big, I mean, if we, if we think, I mean, big data can be many different things, but if we think of big data as, say, the, the product of social media, not something that is collected, but rather something that is constantly coming, right? that, that actually the apprehension of big data is also something that can, can be thought of through volatility in information. Um, and certainly, the kind of uh, the, the the kind of subject position that the that the market maker um, <clears throat> uh, lives lives in and inhabits it, uh, is also one of um, of apprehending volatility. I mean, that's in fact their their job is to demarcate volatility by assigning price differences as information changes. Uh, so. That's where I find myself at the end of this, uh, this day, that perhaps we can think about the future slightly differently, how the future comes to seem real to, uh, to us under, these, under the conditions that we've outlined. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's good that I've got the last of these because there I was this morning, and the given the first up question, which was totally unanswerable <laughs> about the conditions of knowledge, uh, because I find it very interesting that we've not talked about the future of risk at all. We've talked about the present of risk. Uh, and I think there's a very good reason for that, which is that, at least from the social science point of view, almost everything significant that has happened hasn't been predicted. <clears throat> Conversely, almost everything that was predicted hasn't happened. And I'm thinking back to my period in the uh, late 60s and the early 70s as an undergraduate student where things like, well, the future is the Soviet Union, uh, that uh, discourses and models of competitive capitalism are finished, that decarceration is the future and that prisons will empty. <clears throat> so I think very wise that we haven't actually talked about the future of risk. And I think, uh, but I do think about the ways in which governance has thought about the futures of risk. And in particular, as Kevin mentioned, a thing I didn't talk about in my talk but wrote a little about in the paper, was the 9-11 Commission's focus on the bureaucratization of imagination. And it focused, among other things, on the fact that some imaginings of the future had indeed predicted exactly uh, a fully fueled uh, intercontinental airliner crashing into the, the Twin Towers. What the 9-11 Commission said was out of that, we need to bureaucratise imagination. What they didn't say was, of course, yes, but this was one of several thousand imaginings um, and you couldn't govern all of them. And anyone you tried to select as the one to govern was bound to be the wrong one, almost certainly. So to me, that doesn't say give up at all, but it says that, that what is critical is, the, is imagination and that perhaps we are the wrong people to be talking about uh, the future of risk and that the correct people to be talking about the future of risk are science fiction writers, uh, literary writers and so on. So I was thinking during Julie's presentation about a wonderful scene in Don DeLillo's White Noise where during a disaster which may not have been a disaster, uh, the central character is talking to uh, a risk modeler who says how disappointed he is in the current 
disaster because it doesn't meet up with his predictions of what was a good, his profile of what was a good model. So what I really want to say then is not that we should go up, give up at all, but that the techniques for analysing the future are perhaps different, that they are about imagining and that perhaps our modes of analysis aren't necessarily the best modes for imagining the future. And that to think about some of the really important uh, contributions in this domain is to go back mostly, in my view, to literature, to obviously 1984, to Brave New World and so on. Futures which didn't necessarily happen at all. But the imagining of which futures has been politically very, very, very important indeed, and has shaped the present, has shaped their own future. Well, that's about all I could think of to say. But <laughs> I want to thank uh, our, our, our authors uh, for coming <coughs> uh, from very far away to uh, Sydney and Paris and New York. It's kind of far away sometimes. Uh, uh, as well as our, all of our marvelous commentators. Thank you so much. Um, and so what happens next is um, we have a colleague and friend who was in our uh, neoliberalism seminar. Uh, Anna Elise Johnson was having her MFA show at the uh, Logan Center. So we thought that we would uh, head over to the Logan Center to have our reception over there in the midst of an art exhibit. And so um, for anyone who is not familiar, it's a big building on the other side of the Midway. And I'll be heading over there shortly. So if you want to tag along, we'll head over there to have a uh, reception. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anwen, for all of your work. Thank you.